Transforming Women's Health, please welcome George Washington University professor, Dr. Lena Wen, Go. the founder of Every Mother Counts, Christy Turlington Burns, the Senior Vice President of Health at the Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Naveen Rao, and the founder and CEO of Thrive, Ariana Huffington. What a great morning this has already been. And, um, and I'm delighted now to bring a great panel together to discuss the transformation of women's health. Dr. Lena Wen has spent her entire career expanding access to healthcare to those who need it most. Uh, most recently, as the president of Planned Parenthood, and now as a professor at George Washington University School of Medicine, before that as the Commissioner of Health for the City of Baltimore, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, she has been a relentless and fierce advocate for women's health, and since we are going to be talking about women's pregnancy, in the interest of full disclosure, she is four months pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with her second child. Uh, Christy Turlington Burns uh, um, first came to public attention as a supermodel, but she has since then become a force in global maternal health. And after the birth of her first child in 2003, she herself suffered a postpartum hemorrhage when she used her personal story to draw attention to conditions of women's health around the world. And uh, as Christie has written, the belief that knowledge is power is only true if it is clear what needs to be done to make change. Dr. Naveen Rao is the Rockefeller Foundation's Managing Director for Health. His work there includes collaborating with community health providers all over the world, and uh, he came to Rockefeller from Merck, where he led Merck for Mothers, then 500 million initiative to reduce maternal mortality worldwide. So thank you so much all for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Let's start about the fact that men's health is just health. Like nobody. <laughs> yeah. You know, nobody starts political fights over prostate exams, you know. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's not like we don't care. But when it comes to women's health, from maternity leave to abortion to breast breastfeeding, it's all incredibly politicized. And Lena, you actually experienced that uh, this week when you tweeted um, highlighting a comment that Congresswoman Gobbard made in the debate about uh, uh, abortion being safe, legal, and rare. And you were suddenly attacked from all sides. Um, some were attacking you for the rare word, some were attacking you for the legal word. So tell us, what did that feel like? <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for um, everything that you do and for um, the work that our co-panelists do, and it's great to be here with all of you. You know, I come to this work, I think as many of us do, which is as a physician. I'm first and foremost a healthcare provider, and I've seen women die because they don't have access to essential healthcare, which as you, Ariana, said so well, women's healthcare, reproductive healthcare should not be seen any differently from what it is, which is healthcare. Um, we know that banning abortion is not going to stop abortion, but it will stop safe, legal abortion. That's what draws me to this work. We know that there's a state of emergency around women's health in general. I mean, Dr. Rao knows this, as all of us do, that maternal mortality is higher than it was 30 years ago. And there's a lot of work done to change this, but I'm deeply disturbed by how healthcare has become so politicized, so much so that we cannot even discuss our points of agreement and the nuanced views that many people can have 
without being attacked, as you were saying, Ariana, from all sides. I mean, I think a lot of us believe that abortion, for example, is a complex moral issue. And we may not want to have an abortion ourselves, but we we'll never get in the way of somebody else making this deeply personal medical decision for themselves. Or maybe we're even uncomfortable about abortion, but would not want women to die because they don't have access to safe legal abortion either. So I think that to move the conversation forward, I hope that we can begin with these points of agreement and understand and accept the nuances and complexities while emphasizing what we all know to be true, that healthcare has to be a human right guaranteed for all and not just a privilege available only to some. If anybody wants to add anything. I mean, I would add just that um, we were talking backstage and the idea that even maternal health starts when you become pregnant is a fallacy. Um, it starts in adolescence and we don't even have access to sexual and reproductive health information at the right age that would prepare us for these other important transitions of our, um, of our health for the rest of our years. It doesn't, it doesn't, it begins at adolescence and it, it, it ends, you know, at the end of your life. Um, so I think that's just an important thing to remind people. And, and from my perspective is this has been going on from time immemorial. Mm -hmm. All the battles uh, have been raged on the woman's body. And this has been from the birth of civilization and I don't see how and when we will change it unless, as you're saying, we understand our differences and willing to talk. And in this day and age to still be no different than where we were thousands of years ago, that is what is shameful. And Christy, you have taken such a leadership role when it comes to the need for medical research and to be much more equal in terms of women being part of the research. Um, just one example, cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer of women. And we know that symptoms, risk factors, outcomes are different, but women are only one third of the subjects for research. So what can we do about that? Well, you know, I, the first public health work that I did was around tobacco prevention and cessation. And um, in 2000, I believe, was the very first Surgeon General's report on women and tobacco. And that's what shocked me and got me more interested in women's health. Um, our bodies are incredibly different. We cannot be looked at in the same way for heart disease, for cancer, for any of our health conditions, honestly. Um, but because of our reproductive systems, we are more susceptible to a lot of things. Um, and so it really is important that we are looking at human beings equally. This is really a, this is really a gender equality issue at the end of the day. Um, and there isn't enough research in part because it's difficult to study pregnant people um, there's a lot of work now focusing on the study of the placenta because a lot of the complications and causes of death are related to the placenta. Mine was. Um, and we don't know enough. And so it's one of those areas that I think is really lacking um, and could use a lot of funding. And Naveen, you have done a lot of work around uh, uh, the need for data and technology to be more equally distributed because we now have this digital divide when it comes to the availability and use of data and technology um, around women's health. No, I, I absolutely agree. So the, the problem statement here is unfortunately that in this day and age, the act of giving birth is still the most dangerous thing a woman can go through. Mm -hmm. And it need not be like that. And, and the reason why women die during pregnancy or childbirth, mostly preventable. And so the, 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 the analogy that comes to my mind is the 24 hours around the birth, that if that is a day, so that's one day. Most mothers, most women give us 364 days of the year. All they say is that give us that one day, protect us when we are vulnerable and we look away. And that has been going on, again, 
since the birth of civilization. That, that act of giving birth is dangerous, and unless you're there, and the irony is it's all, most of them are preventable, those, those deaths are preventable. So one of, the, one of the reasons why we feel optimistic going forward is the power of data, data science. Data, data science has disrupted all your lives. I mean, today, all of you check your weather forecast, all of you do GPS, all of you, I mean, even 10, 15 years ago, these were not there. So our lives have disrupted, but that has not come through on public health and definitely not come through on the, on the woman's side and the mother and child side. And so I feel optimistic that if we do it right this time, that we will not allow data now to become the social divide the class divide. I mean, just as today, if money is the class divide, those who have more money have better health than those who do not have more money. Unfortunately, I believe the class divide of the future will be data. And if you're not careful, those who have access to data will have better health than those who don't have access to data. And that's how it's headed. And even within the data divide of the data inequity that is exacerbating health inequities, it's between countries in the country and in the same community is gender divide again. One small example is if you go into the rural villages in India or Africa, and this is throughout I, uh, my travels I've seen, is that in the same hut, if the, the man is the farmer, today he's got on his phone apps with weather forecasting, tell him when to plant. He knows what the price of the crop is, when to sell. He has those tools and his wife, who's the community health worker, has six registers that she's filling out in the same community. Why is it that there is this data divide, inequity, and if you're not careful, that will continue to happen, but I still feel optimistic that data and predictive analytics and tools are the way out of this. And Naveen, how can we also use data and predictive, predictive analytics and AI uh, to help all of us change behaviors. Because right now we're at this interesting moment when a hundred years ago, uh, most people were killed and died by infectious diseases. Today, what's killing us is our behaviors. With the increase in chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, and, and if you add mental health, the skyrocketing rates of depression and anxiety, 90% of healthcare problems and healthcare costs are lifestyle, stress-related, and preventable. How can we use data and AI to help people change behaviors? Because if we don't focus on that, and if we only focus, as the democratic debate at the moment is just about access and financing healthcare, which is very important, but if we don't address the other 90%, which is like a $3 trillion industry, we're not going to be able significantly to change outcomes. We'd love to know um, how you all look at that, because it particularly affects women. So I personally subscribe to the philosophy that all the answers to all our problem have already been, um, been discovered, but by some other industry. So if you really look at it from what you're asking, how come the gaming industry has figured this out? They know, based on your social profile and where you buy, what you do, what kind of game, how to get you hooked, what are the incentives? <laughs> so how can we learn from industries that have understood how technology can help us uh, get better at, uh, at behavioral change? Uh, one small example is that we currently, and I'm going back to the community health worker example uh, for maternal health, we paint community health workers with one breaststroke, that they're all the same. We all presume if we send them texts, they will know what to do and that their incentives are the same. They all come from the same background. But that's not how the industry who wants to sell you something does it. So can we learn from the industries that have used technology for behavioral change? And there are many examples where if you actually profile them with background, find the right incentives, and then get the right messaging through, technology can help us with behavior change like nothing else has in the past. Can I just add to that? Um, when you bring up community health workers, it just makes me think of 
how important um, and how sort of lost sometimes the simpler solutions can be. And I do think that positive modeling in terms of health behavior is the most effective way mm -hmm. to change behavior. Um, when you have a person in a community who is seeking health care early on, um, exploring their options, coming back and, and sharing with their neighbors and their friends what that experience was like, um, ultimately, you know, like that's the kind of, um, that's how we, that's how we, that's how we operate really. I mean, women do anyway. I don't know if men always do, but women certainly do. Um, so technology is so critical and so important, but in the hands of people who are also working with those simple solutions that we know, a human being that's trained and is, has the right kinds of leadership skills um, with technology is the best combination we can have. And Christy, what you say, what you bring up, I think is such a good point about that high touch model too. Um, it's a core principle of public health that you have to find the most credible messengers to reach people where they are. Um, in Baltimore, we have a very successful program called Be More for Healthy Babies that within seven years reduced the infant mortality in our city by 38% and also critically close the disparity between black and white infant mortality by over 50% in that same period. Thank you. And, um, and by the way, I just w actually wanted to take a moment in mentioning Baltimore. Um, today, this morning, we found out about the passing of, the, of one of our great heroes and my personal mentor, Congressman Elijah Cummings, mm. who was absolutely essential in so much of our work in promoting health equity, reducing disparities in Baltimore and all around the country. He was instrumental in a program like this too. And he often liked to talk about how our conversation would not be complete unless we also mentioned that choice is predicated on privilege. Mm -hmm. And we need to bring that into the conversation and therefore that improving health as a metric is not enough unless we also very specifically focus on reducing the disparities that bend the arc of our universe away from justice. Yep. So it's really bringing together the latest of technology and the most ancient human values of uh, caring and empathy and bringing the two together. And I, I just really, love what you all said about bringing also storytelling into the technology. Uh, and you have the examples, I mean, Christy, the fashion industry, we should learn a lot from it. Mm -hmm. You know, how does the fashion industry uh, activate this desire, for example, in a woman who maybe makes 60000 a year to own this $2,000 Prada bag? You know, how can we take, as you said, what the fashion industry knows, what the gaming industry knows, and use them for good to improve health. Uh, maybe here there are people from all these industries who can help us, but it transforms the health debate. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really speak on behalf of the fashion industry because it's been a while that I've been <laughs> immersed in it, but um, I would say any corporate has a role to play in this, um, from the policies that they have for their employees. Um, you know, maternity care, family leave policies are instrumental. Um, so when I am around people in, in, in the fashion industry, that's the kind of role that they can play in terms of leadership, right? This, this, is, you know, this is an industry that's mostly um, serving or <laughs> selling to women. Um, so the idea of also really thinking about what kinds of policies are going to improve the experience um, of their female uh, employees is a really important place to start. Last May, the World Health Organization acknowledged burnout as an actual disease syndrome, and women are particularly affected by it. You know, women in particularly stressful jobs have a 40% greater incidence of heart disease and a 60% a greater risk of type 2 diabetes. So, how can we use everything we've discussed here around data and storytelling and human wisdom to also help all of us change the way we work and live? Because so many um, workplaces are now fueled by burnout, but women are paying a heavier price. And if you add to that the growing addiction to social media and technology after work hours, we are dealing with a real epidemic. We'd love to know 
what you think we can do differently? It's so hard. I mean, I think part of the issue with this, how difficult this question is, is so often women are the caregivers for everyone around us. Um, and we take care of our spouses, our children, our parents, and not always take care of ourselves. And I know that for me, we, my family learned this the hard way when my mother was not diagnosed for over a year before she finally learned that she had breast cancer that by then was metastatic. And that was something that she always imparted on us, that we have to take care of ourselves. And not just think about maternal health as this is what happens at the point of pregnancy, although I certainly agree that labor and delivery is potentially a dangerous time, and we need to do something about it. But we need to take care of women and take care of each other throughout our lives, and also be courageous and vulnerable about telling our own stories as a way to fight that stigma and fear that may be around us. I think you touch on prevention, and you're really touching on prevention too, which, I mean, we can't, it can't be said enough how important it is to be our healthiest selves before um, our lives get more complicated so that we have the tools and the skills within ourselves to be able to manage those, those you know, circumstances that we can't control, stressful lives, um, unwell family members, um, our own health, uh, you know, complications. I think um, starting as early as we possibly can and knowing that this is this continuum, we're thinking about health from beginning to end of life. Naveen, maybe you can bring us to a close by telling us whatever it is that you want to leave us with from your work over so many years around the world. And I'm trying to put it in perspective of what all, 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 all what we heard on the panel. It, I remind, it reminds me of, the, of a quote that started me on this journey, and it's amazing it's coming back to me today here. It's by an obstetrician, an Egyptian obstetrician called Muhammad Fatala. And he said it very poignantly. He said, in this instance, it's about women dying, but you can substitute that for any of the comments that uh, my co-panelists have made. Women are dying not because we don't know how to save them. They're dying because we have yet to decide they're worth saving. Mm. But as a man, I'm ashamed. Well, thank you for all the work you are doing um, to make sure that not only are women worth saving, but we treat them with all the necessary differences, acknowledging that different treatments are needed. And that we treat women's health care, reproductive health care, no differently than any other aspect of health care, which, again, health care as a whole should not be politicized, it should not be political, because we're, at the end of the day, talking about a basic human right. I don't know that I have much to add other than I am in complete agreement. Um, I, you know, I'm very focused on maternal health, and so, as I said, like, you know, before, during, and after pregnancy is a critical time, and not just the 24 hours, but really most of these deaths are happening postpartum, so that's another huge gap in our health care system, our maternity care system is the postpartum period. Um, not just moms, all the people who depend on us, all the people who love us, people who care about our well-being, um, this is a, an issue for everyone. And with so many amazing people here from the healthcare industry, it would be great if we all join forces to truly focus on prevention, both when it comes to reproductive health and to all the chronic diseases that are killing uh, millions of Americans every year and also millions of people around the world, and uh, broaden this debate beyond how best to manage what is effectively now a disease system. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Thank you.